and Jenny Burton. Thank you for coming today to our talk. The topic is 10 tips to give you and your child success. These are based upon 35, I guess 38 years of teaching now. I have taught in the Stevens Point program here, coming fresh out of my master's degree with Marjorie Weber. Uh, I saw Dr. Suzuki when he came here to visit in the 70s and in the 90s. So uh, I was like a little puppy dog watching him. You may hear little tidbits about those days uh, in this talk. Uh, and then I moved to Dallas for 13 years and then came back home. And I teach here again at the Aver Suzuki Center. Um, the 10 tips that I'm going to discuss with you, they're things that I found to be key to the success of families that have done things really well. And I want to share these with you to give you shortcuts on how to help guide your students or your children. How many of you are parents? You may wear more than one hat. How many are teachers? And how many are parents and teachers? Okay, so you are a seven and grandparent. And a, oh, I'm sorry, grandparents. <laughs> Very special group of people I love. Thanks for being here. Um, you'll be able to relate. When I say child, think either child slash student. And they can be your own children. It, in some cases, can be yourself, because we all are students as well, students of life. Number one is perspective. And these are not necessarily in order, but this is a good way to start. If we see a child here, think, think of a child in your studio or your own family. What do you see before you? Take one of your beginner students. Do you see a child who has no goal control? Let's say they're just starting. Or do you see a child who is learning to play with a tall violin? Do we see a child who can't sit at a piano bench for more than a minute? Or do we see a child that can play variation A with beautiful tone one time? Do we see, how do we see growth? Do we expect it to happen in one lesson? A year? A Japanese bamboo tree shows no visible growth, get this, for four years. On the fifth year, it shoots up to nine feet. Does it remind you of maybe a student in your uh, studio or someone in your family that might suddenly have a physical growth spurt or an emotional growth spurt or a technical growth spurt? How do we look at a challenge? Does it seem insurmountable? Or is it an opportunity? Here's this section. Some of these ideas are taken from Alice Joy Brooks that I heard her a couple of years ago share these same ideas. And she's the one who spurred me to think about the 10 keys that I would choose. And she started her talk with this image of the bamboo tree shooting up. So Alice Joy is here. Alice Joy, you're here in this very lecture room. We love you. So do you think that a challenge is an insurmountable feat? Or is it an opportunity? Imagine you're a shoe salesman in a tiny little village in China that doesn't have, the, where the people don't wear shoes. Let's say you move there with your spouse who got a job there. And you're in this, this place, and all you know how to do is to make and sell shoes. Do you see that as a missed opportunity? A barren place with nothing to, no opportunity for you? Or do you see it as a chance to bring a new idea to people who don't, have never had shoes before? So all of these analogies are helpful in how, you, how we look at our kids. I've had people uh, come to me after studying the Twinkle Variations for maybe a couple of months and they'll say, we're ever going to be through the twinkles? When are we going to be done with the twinkles? And I say to that parent, when your child is playing the twinkle variations, I see them playing the Bach double in book four, book five. The very first measure has da 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 stop stop. Dr. Suzuki aimed for that piece when he selected the twinkle variations. That's what he had in mind. He didn't have Book one is the goal. He didn't have the twinkle variations as a goal. In fact, his goal is to have it possible for every child, every 
human being to be able to play. And the building blocks. We never finish twinkles. I give twinkle variations to the students of Mozart. Played spiccato with a different part of the bowl. So you no, know, the twinkle, there's a matter of perspective. When are we going to be done with the twinkles? It's a very profound question, actually. It's a good question. The goal in, for perspective, then, is to make the learning environment safe so the child trusts you and can be free to create. On your paper, it says free to make mistakes. Every child feels free to have success. In this country especially, we value success. What I found to be the biggest challenge is to find a safe place for a child to create and to be free to learn from mistakes. Here's a really good example. I had a student, his name is, is Alex, and I just saw him uh, in Dallas when I was there. And he was, he was a perfectionist. And as a five-year-old, I learned quickly that he, when he would make a mistake, he hated it, and he'd freeze. So here was Alex, playing, he was on etude at this point. He was playing on bum, 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 you and I can figure this out. And he still stayed in his ball. And I said, let's, let's try it with, I'll think of one thing to help you. And so he'd, he'd get up, he'd try it again, and I'd help him through that spot. This would happen from time to time. And I thought to myself, I need to think of it differently. I want to see this piece through Alex's head and body and mind and soul. And I, when that happened again later, uh, maybe a it didn't happen every week, maybe a month or so. I said, Alex, violin is hard, isn't it? And he looked up at me. He got right out of his ball. He didn't know how to articulate. It was hard for him. And once he I said, once, now we have a dialogue going. And I said, Alex, when, when violin gets hard for me, I want to throw my violin sometimes. It makes me want to not try and just give up. I just, I get so frustrated. I hardly know the words to say. I was giving him words to explain what was going on inside of him. And I wanted, to, wanted him to know it's natural and normal to make mistakes. And I said, you know, Alex, I don't mind if you don't get it the first time. I don't mind if you don't get it the second or the third time. I will help you get it right one time and we'll figure it out together. What do you think about that? Mistakes can be our friends. So I'm making it safe for him to be creative. And I'll say, I, make, I told him, I said, I, I make mistakes. And sometimes when I'm playing for the kids, I've learned to say, I own up to a mistake and I say, whoops. Oh, I, I can make a better tone, I'll try again. And I just show them, I illustrate how my, what I learned from a mistake, and I use that phrase. I, I want to learn from that mistake. I'm going to try something else. I love that formula right there. It works. Try something else. With at an institute, I'll make it clear to kids in the master class. If you know you can do something better, just try something else and see what happens. And I read someplace it takes some kids seven seconds to formulate first that they they realize they made a goof, and then what to do about it. So. Other kids just rush on through it like, maybe no one heard the difference. I'll just keep going. And then another mistake happens, I'll just keep going. And I'll, I'll say to the kids, I much prefer, if you hear it yourself, if you know you can fix it, just back up or start over. Try it again. Try something else. I want them to get a chance to match what's going on in their head. And I'll, it, it's amazing how that frees the kids. So perspective involves making a safety net, not only how we see the learning process and our role with the child, but how we see the process of learning, how, to, how we can learn from mistakes to make it a free environment. That's number one. Number two, understand that people are different. Now this seems so obvious, but I want to suggest some things that may 
some strategies. Um, some kids are morning people. How many of you have children? And, or how many of you are morning people? I'm a big time morning person. Uh, how many of you are evening people? Yep, and there's, we're all sorts. How many don't mind that or you either way? Yeah, so there's some of all of us. Um, some kids need a lot of encouragement, positive reinforcements. Other kids like the challenges and just, like, you don't always have to be giving them praises. They like to just pull, pull the praise for when it's really what they can do the best. They, they don't feed off of that. So our temperaments. And sometimes uh, you can give support with just a smile for the really sensitive kids. Some are risk takers. Some just love to sound out a little bit of the next piece. Other kids hold back because they don't want to fail. With the kids that are risk takers, I make sure to ask them to listen to their next piece a hundred times before they explore so that they get the correct model in their head. And that especially as they get older. Some kids love group classes. Some prefer to play the violin for themselves or their family or one person rather than for a whole bunch of people. I'm real careful not to push them into a setting. The ones that prefer a one-to-one -one audience, not to make them play for a big audience till they're ready. And just gradually, I find where their com comfort level is. If a parent comes to me and says, my child, I, just, I don't know if they want to play their joint graduation in that big setting with all Nicholson Hall, with all those people there, I don't, I don't think it's time. And then I'll say, how about if we go there after a marathon? It's like our play-ins, big groups. And I'll go up on stage and we'll just take a bow. Just us, without making it, and then we'll take another step. How about if we play um, variation A on open E 10 times? Or the E string concerto, so the piano has a cool part. So you find ways to make it safe for that child who's sensitive inside. It needs encouragement, but in small steps. Uh, I learned that some students like to have uh, a lot of structure in their home practices. So those kids like, like columns and to put little check marks and sometimes stickers. Other kids just like a list. Some parents, some parents like to record the lesson uh, with their phones and have the main points put on there. Other parents like to write out their notes, and I, I ask those parents, most of my parents write notes for me with carbon copies so that I stay on the same page. And I'll get really cool messages like, oh, our dog died this week, please bear that in mind, you've had a rough time. Call me later and I'll tell you more. Or my child is very resistant this week for some reason, and I think it has to do with bullying at school. Can you give me a call? I'll get notes at the bottom of my carbon copy sheet from them that have nothing to do with the lesson. But it's a really great way to establish communication. So some parents like to write, some like would rather talk. Some kids are that uh, more tactile with their instruments and want to have lots of motion in their lesson. So the squirmy kids, a lot of times they're kinesthetic learners. And I'll make sure to let them run around a little bit. The twinklers that just don't seem to be able to focus at all, we'll, I'll break it down into little tiny nuggets. Autistic kids, like a lot of structure, everything the same, the format the same, have a little check mark here, that's done. Let them run around, let them run around if they need it. Come back and choose another box to work on, check that off. There might be one box that they do that day for the first lesson. Anyway, so understand that people are different. And if you're an evening person and the child is a morning person, to make life work for you, for helping your child, go with the child's learning, best learning time. Three, help your child find a creative flow that is in them. Help your child find a creative flow that is best for them. There's a book by Chick Sentmihai, which is a funny, uh, last name, but the name of the book is Flow. Has anybody read it by any chance? It's a, it describes the moments of creativity where you lose track of time. Um, I have a, uh, a 
stamp collection. And when I have like a week off, out comes the stamp collection. And I'll have these great big volumes and I'll open them up and they'll cover the entire dining room table. And so the meals have to be held elsewhere for that time. And I will truly, once I get going and putting them in and figuring out how, how much are they worth and all of this, I love sorting. And so I, all of a sudden it's three in the morning. And I'm a morning person and I fall asleep at that puts me in flow. I get in that zone where all of a sudden, or if I'm working on a project and I'm working with SAA, I, I just, once I get going on a uh, creative idea, all of a sudden I've lost a couple hours. I mean, the time has flown. I shouldn't say I lost it. I found creativity in that time. So the flow experience is very interesting. One uh, model I'd like to share with you is that this is when something is hard. Like struggle, struggle, struggle. I kind of I learned that way in the public schools, um, and I turned out fine. There's nothing wrong with learning in the schools, but this is how I learned. This is hard. This is easy. And this is steady. This is me. New material. Uh, pause. New material. Uh, pause. New material. Uh, and by senior year, I I got to the same place that all the other kids did who might have been playing by ear, but how I got there was stressful, filled with newness. I like challenges. I'm one of those kids, high achiever sorts. So it wasn't, I wasn't adverse to it, but what I really like about Suzuki, oh, well, here's the other uh, extreme. If it's too easy, boring, boring, oh yeah, I can do that. The kids that have the brains that say, I got it. Okay, now what? I'm not going to repeat that ten times. I got it. I'll say to them, and, and this is a really cool strategy. The mind is brilliant, but the muscles need to be trained. They're, they're pretty stupid until you tell them what to do. And then all of a sudden, the muscles are smart. But it takes repetitions. And daily repetitions, like when you go uh, sledding a, a, out on a hill in Iverson Park here, you take your sled down there, your toboggan, your sled, and you start going down the hill the first time, and it's the snow is packing, and kind of goes, then you get to the end, and then you haul it back up, and then you go down again the second time, what's going to happen? It starts getting faster and faster, so the more times with those kids, I'll say, I'll use that tactic. The brain gets it. But then to make it easy for the muscles, it takes 7 to 11 repetitions a day for 30 days to get the track to be smooth and it, your muscles get it. It's a really good way to deal with kids who get bored with repetition. So, and with those kids, I'll give them extra challenges to do the, um, I challenge you to play Tinkle Variation A in every room in your house with 10 repetitions with a perfect position and bow hand. 10 times in every room in your house. Then that gets a moving around, okay, which room do I go to next, okay. Give them challenges to make what's easy for them a little bit more challenging and more interesting. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to deal with how we can help find strategies that will attend to the needs of the child. Number four, listening is the fastest way to grow. Sue Bear from Washington State told me that she asks her students to listen to a new piece coming up, the next piece, a hundred times before they start it on the instrument. Now think about that. Think of all the time you put into planning, like remodeling your home. If you're, uh, let's say you're remodeling your bath bathroom. And you, you go to the store and you look at all the fixtures and you imagine what color the walls will be. So we spend all this time in a project like that to do research and to get the job done. What do we do for our listening environment? Isn't that at least as important as a room in the house? And it's a fast, and we keep bringing this now back to concrete stuff. The more we can get the music in our heads, Suzuki would say 10,000 times. It was a metaphor. 
the more, it actually has been proven to be true, that magic number of 10,000 with outliers and people like the Beatles, groups like the Beatles who did things so that it did 10,000 times. It took them 10,000 times to get as good as they were. That number has proven, has proven out. And it, it's in that book, it's a great book. Has anybody read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? It's a great book. And it's easy to read. I loved it. He's a very good writer. Entertaining. You can kind of go in there and just look at a chapter. So listening is the fastest way to grow. If I can tell the moment a child stops listening or hasn't listened, listened enough, especially in the upper level books. Here's a scenario. A child in uh, book six, Handel Sonatas, with the violin comes in and plays incorrect notes, incorrect rhythms. I bet that child had read the piece before they listened to it. The very first time we encounter a piece, if it's done through reading without listening, that moment is creating a groove in the brain that is very hard to overcome. It's like a master groove that's inside the brain and the body and it remembers. So incorrect listening causes in, imprecise playing. So I'll tell those more advanced kids to play that new piece so that they can be their own teachers, to hear, get the model in their head, so they don't have to unlearn and relearn. One step learning comes from enough listening. One step learning means the first time you experience a piece and te we teach it to the kids, we, they've heard it in their head, they know how it goes. Does that make sense? Okay, cool, thank you. Five, find a community to share your journey with. Well, you're all here at the Institute. And many of you are teachers, many of you are parents, some are both, and you've got grandparents here. Fabulous. Fabulous environment, fabulous environment. How many of you have gone to at least one of the uh, lectures since you've been here this week? Look at that, fantastic, good. I, and I feel honored that this is the first one. But this is the place of all the institutes. This institute offers more parent and teacher lectures than any institute that I know of. This is the place we believe in parent and teacher training. Dr. Suzuki said to Marjorie Aver, I want this place to be a teacher training center. He said that to other people as well. He chose several places. This was the first summer Suzuki camp outside of Matsumoto. Marjorie took that very seriously. And the model that we have for the A, B, C, D classes has been applied throughout North and South America because of our dedication to that. The resources are here. Concerts, lectures, books. Oh man, there's a cool book you have to read called, called Eureka. Eureka, I don't have the author's name, but that's just, I don't think there are many books called Eureka. That's the aha moment. We're after making learning exciting and interesting. Flow, that's an, I like these one word titles, flow. To find a way to uh, get learning to have Put us in that zone where it's interesting, and not too easy and not too hard, but enables us to grow like this. Suzuki gives, says to te in the teacher training um, classes, they'll say previews, those are, those are the new materials, and then review, new material, review, preview, oh, they're trying hard, but it's going like this. The Suzuki method is just that. The way I learn, oh, maybe we're going to get there. Do I really like this? Suzuki, oh, it's a little, oh, I like this. Oh, it's easy. Violin is easy. I have friends. We go places. We do things together. We can make music with other kids. Anyway, one thing with the community, uh, how many of you have uh, group class experiences that either you teach them or your child goes to them? Okay, a lot of them. Good for you. Great place. I often see parents bonding. You can see them talking with each other. 
if you people who have stumbling blocks, we all have stumbling blocks. And the very first time, I'll often pair a new parent with a veteran. And I'll say, expect to have ups and downs. There'll be some days where you might your child will want to quit. If that happens, be sure to talk to your teacher before it's too late. If you're frustrated, talk to a parent. This parent, veteran parent would be happy to share stories with you and how they get over the hurdles. The teacher had, the, we teachers, how many teachers have had uh, discussions with parents whose children would quit? Frustrated, sure, it's natural. We're in a long-term relationship. Relationships are like that, they're ups and downs. Sometimes they split. Oftentimes, the work that's put into making something work takes effort. And expect to have times where that the conversations need to happen between the teacher and the parent and listening to the child. Number six, ask questions of your teacher when you don't understand something or if things are going badly in home practice. Don't over here. I kind of alluded to that. Um, one thing that I, I like to, uh, don't wait till it's too late. The, the hardest thing for me as a teacher to hear is that when a parent comes in to their lesson and I see this look in their eye and go down like this and they say, and I see they're violent in the case and the parent will say, I'm sorry, you need to quit. And this, it breaks my heart. It doesn't give me a chance to help. I'm a heck of a referee. I've heard many stories. I could, I've had like hundreds of four-year-olds, hundreds of, uh, not quite hundreds of two-year-olds, but maybe a hundred two-year-olds, hundreds of four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. I know the patterns. I know how to help. There's an answer for things. And in one case, I'll tell you uh, very soon, with that balance, I lost a student, high school student, but I gained a whole human being. We'll hear that story in a minute. Number seven, help your child become an individual learner. I mean, I should, I should say independent, I'm sorry. Independent, I knew I'd be meeting my concept or something. Independent learner. Did anybody hear Emory Novak speak? She talked about the path to independence. Fabulous, it's, it's something that occurs where the child earns the right to study by themselves. There's a, a time around seven, eight, nine, ten, where the kids want so much to do it by themselves, but at first they're not ready. So that there's a plan that can be evolved between the teacher and the child and the parents. And eventually, and it's hard for the parent. I know I've discovered, discovered many parents who say, um, Sarah from Dallas said to me, Jenny, it's driving me nuts. Andrew was maybe 11 years old, first week of independent practice. She said, I can't stand it. He's, he's just rushing through the material and he's not fixing mistakes. I said, Sarah, thank you for calling. This is frustrating for you, isn't it? She said, I've been there all this time, all these years. I've gone to the lesson. I've carefully helped him do his preview and do the order of things, and he's not doing it. And I said, Sarah, tell me more. I wanted her to tell me how hard it was for her to let go. And then at the end I said, Sarah, at the lesson, next lesson, let me deal with Andrew directly. Because I knew Andrew knew better. And I, all I asked him in this lesson was, uh, Andrew, can you show me how you practice this? And he kind of gave me this blank stare, deer in the headlights. And I said, hmm, I remember last week we drilled that in a specific way. We broke it down. You remember how we broke it down? No, I don't remember, Miss Burton. So we, I did it again with him. I said, Andrew, this is your job to practice this way. You're your own parent. I, I expect you to be accountable for what your assignments are. So anyway, it's uh, becoming an individual learner in develop steps that involve critical thinking, being accountable for bringing the materials, being prepared to come to the lesson, 
having some kind of a plan for practice at home, I usually divide it up into categories. Like for a while, I'll give them a chance to show me that they can be accountable. And use that word accountable for one part of practice. So when they come back to the lesson, they can play with tonalization with a gorgeous posture and whatever the teaching point is that week. The next week they come back, it's done, brush, check it off. And they're taking their own notes at this point. And then in their book, they're on their sheet, they'll say, this is my individual practice point. And once they get through all the different the warm up, the reading, the tonalizations, the uh, review pieces, and the current piece, then they're ready to practice by themselves. And I give them the chance. We work on critical thinking skills. How to tell when it's right? How many times do you repeat it to make it stick? So that they, when they get home, they're not wondering, well, now what do I do? But if they don't know what to do, they'll just run through it all. So I learned to be more specific, too. When Sarah called me with that, I gave her, I let her get off the book, and I said, I'll take care of how to communicate with Andrew. Trust me. Um, eight, find balance. Uh, early on, when, before we started, I asked some of the people that were in the room to draw their hand on a piece of paper. You just turn it over and make a little drawing of your hand. If you think about the parts of your life that give you value and meaning, what are the, some of the things that the people that were here early uh, worked on? What did you say? Health and work. Rest, relaxation. Family. Family, yes, good, good. Your job, if you're a student, it would be going to school. Something else you're thinking of something? Free time. Free time, yes, thank you. Music. Good, good, I like it. Friends. Good, I love it. Now with this model, there might be other things. Um, I, I think I may have given you some of the stuff I put out there. Um, home, did, did, did I put mine or did I take it off? Home, work, play, rest. Okay, that, that, those are suggestions. And now when I'm traveling during an institute, my work part goes way out of balance. I don't see my family as much, so that, that prong is down for a while. I just certainly don't get as much rest. So the work, this model, there will be times when certain prongs, all of you who are traveling here, the work one or the study prong is way out here on purpose. And there, there may be a, if you take time to take a walk in the woods, I have to walk to feel balanced within myself. So no matter where I am, I make sure that's part of what I do. It gives me back my energy. And I'm actually an introvert, so I need to walk, oops, I need to have some space to be by myself to gear up to give again. If I'm an extrovert, if I'm out, I want to talk to as many people as I can to make sure I have energy to spend and study. So knowing that that's a part of, I have a student, I'm going to give you an example here. Her music prom was so way out there. It had five parts. She took piano lessons, flute lessons, violin lessons, that's where I was. She was in the church choir, and she was in the band. And the orchestra, oh my gosh, six proms. She came to her violin lesson during finals week, junior in high school. Just, and her parents were going through uh, rough times. Uh, separation was happening. Her life was unraveling in front of my eyes. I said, Jolie, what's going on in your life? And she told me, she said, oh, it's finals, and we were getting ready to take this, uh, our solo and ensemble is coming up. I, I just, I can't deal with it. I said, Joey, I want you to drop one of your instruments and know that it will give you a chunk of your life back. There's a lot in your life that you can't control. This is something you can control. She ended up dropping piano and violin and chose to study flute. And I said, I'm so glad. She came to the lesson and she was like this. And I said, I think you've got something to tell me. What did you decide? And she said, I decided to go to flute. I said, good for you. I'm so excited. Now you don't have to have that. You know the joy of playing those other instruments. And I'll see you in the halls. And the most important thing is that you have 
found balance in your life. That's where this whole idea of balance came from. To find to make it. This this story is powerful. And it's a true story. So that crown is now and her family life settled down. So there are times with this model, just think about this. If you're having a stressed part of your life, think about where, where you're putting your time. You can't do it all. Or I see this model being very helpful for kids in high school or junior high. If you, I see so many kids and so many things. If I see this coming, I can, I've seen it happen. I've seen kids get burned out, and it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'd rather lose a student than to lose a person to mental illness. It's just, just carry this as a story. You can tell my story and share it. Because she's happy. She's content. She ended up getting a, a scholarship to go to college in Duke. It's all about what's healthy. Nine, look at practice as a time to bond with your child. I love what Marjorie Avery used to say, look at practice as a time to practice patience and love. Terry Durbin would add these notes. Did anybody hear Terry's talks at 5 o'clock? Oh boy, changed my life, changed my life. He uses word, words like this, use practice time. He would fill that in with empathy, creativity. Look at practice time as a time to work on sensitivity. I look at it as seeing the whole big picture of the child. If, if we only look at the structure of getting the notes done, we're missing the point. Music is, should be a place where we fill our lives with joy, exploration, discovery. Finally, Take care in how you measure your child's success. Um, Lisa Chosey gave me this quote, and I think it's marvelous. The child should be the yardstick for measurement. By focusing on your child and their personal, her personal growth, you will avoid the dangerous pitfalls of comparing your child to other students. With the child as the yardstick, decide what you're going to measure. Look at the level of concentration. Has the attention span grown? Examine practice habits. Has a routine for efficient practice been established? What new skills has your child acquired? Her repertoire. Has the quality of performance improved? These are questions. It's not what piece they're on. I hear some parents saying, is my child going fast enough? Is she on the pieces? Or in a group class, that she'll see, oh, my child's sitting down there. Is there something wrong with my child? And I'll say to her, your child is so skilled. She watches me like a hawk. She's a good team player. And she's learning a lot by listening to those pieces and how she'll fit in when she's learning those notes. She's got the team attitude. That's what we're here for. She's already there. She's on my team. Be happy that she's a good team player. So in short, in short joy is in the journey. The point is not the destination to be on what piece. And yes, have, are we there yet? Of course, you're, you're a precious half of a shell that's creating, ever evolving. As you grow, the other half comes next to it. And all the while, the inside part is alive and well. So yes, are we there yet? Yes, you are. These are just some tips that I've come across over the years that I, I really, I can save some heartache, I can give you shortcuts, and these are the, I thought long and hard about this lecture, how I can give you some tips in your home practices and with your students. Are there any, uh, we have time for a couple questions? It's a little after the quarter till. Any comments, questions? I think, I think you got it, yes, just a comment.
when the, when the, it's in an individual lesson, it's different than in a group class. So I took the kids in a group class setting are very different. If it's a group class setting, we set the ground rules for if they need to let the emotions out, I'll have the parent take them out. Go figure it. Just to have a little uh, calming down time. If it's during the lesson, we'll just I'll have a moment where I'll ask them to just sit and put their cross their feet and cross their arms and close their eyes. It's a brain gym kind of thing, just to literally wrap themselves up. And it, it may take a little, you might have to start just to sit in a chair and, and say, this is, this is what we're going to try. But when you feel that way, it's okay to sit in your, let's find a safe chair. And there'll be a safe chair that we'll choose. And then let's, let's add this. Just wrap your, let your feet give you a hug. Yeah, I noticed he likes to sit down. Mm -hmm. Let him do that. Find, find his comfort zone. Yes? Can you give some tips for dealing with the defiant child, like our, maybe a 12-year-old, for example, who you know that they know the piece, or the part, or the spot practice, but they're like, but I can't do it. No, I can't. And you, you know, and you know that they're not trying. And how do you, it's, it's a power struggle. It's like they're trying to assert their independence. Like, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. I'm only going to do what I want to do, which is not anything, you know, if you want me to do it, I don't want to do it. So how do you deal with a defiant or a power when you're in a power struggle? It, with a 12-year-old, right in that teenage year, uh, I would say um, I'd like you to make uh, a video for your teacher of that spot in the way that the teacher wants you to do it. You don't, I don't have, you don't have to show me that. Put it on a video and take it to your lesson. And let that be, if that, because a 12-year-old wants to be independent, and if she doesn't want to do it for you, if she's not going to do it for the teacher, then the teacher will deal with her. If she comes back to the lesson, if she chooses not to do the work, that's something the teacher, then it becomes, if it's a power struggle with the teacher, that's another issue. Um, depends if she wants to, and she may need to not be placed it fast, or if it's just a power thing, um, she's got to figure that out, get over it, I would say. I mean, it, it, to grow, there, there's got to be some effort. So but that's a conversation that the teacher can have rather than putting the in the water. Because I think that might be a faster way to get her to do her job. And if, by taking a video of it, then it's something that she can just do in her own terms. Just go in your room and just make your video and then come back. And, so you're still working with your daughter. She's getting more independent. But sometimes I even see that with her teacher. And I know a teacher is like, hey, you can move through this much faster if you just do it. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just a hump she'll get over. Her. Once she, has, she has opposition defiant disorder, so she's very I see. defiant with any person in authority. I see. Does she, how does she do with new material if her teacher, if her teacher plays it really slowly? Does she play along with her? Yeah, she's, she, your, your teacher could make a video of them working together. Just set up the cameras and just slowly so she could have success and maybe chunk it up, chunk and chunk and make little chunks and tiny little videos so she could, she probably is looking for a safe zone to uh, figure it out. And, and just as if she can find something she's comfortable doing with her teacher, put it on a video and then let her do that course.